Ella Batty, and I'm going to be talking about behavioural readouts in typical neuroscience experiments. So let's start with why we want to read out behaviour. We often just care about behaviour itself. So just by studying the behaviour of animals, we can start to understand the strategies they use behind decision making, the types of memories they form and the qualities of those memories, and how they perceive sensory information, among many other things. As neuroscientists, though, we often also want to relate behaviour to neural activity. So typically when we're recording from the brain of an animal, we want to relate it to something the animal is experiencing or doing. So in some experiments, we'll just have the animal be pretty passive and we'll show sensory stimuli to that animal, like a video. In these cases, we probably don't care as much about the animal behavior because it's not really doing anything, it's just taking in the stimuli passively. Often though, we really want to study the brain of an animal while it's actively performing a task or doing some natural behavior. So we use a lot of different model organisms in neuroscience. We use mice, rats, flies, monkeys, fish, humans, among others. And that means there's a lot of different types of behaviors to study. Reading out swimming from fish is very different from reading out flying from flies and so on. We also care about different levels of granularity depending on the questions we're asking. So sometimes we just need to know what decision a monkey is making and sometimes we want to know about the tiny little nose twitches it's making. And so all this means that there are a lot of different behavioral readouts in neuroscience, and I'm not going to be able to comprehensively cover all of them in this video. Instead, I'm going to give, try and give you a flavor of different types of behavioral readouts, and I'll go through some example behavioral readouts of decision-making, complex movements, learning and memory, and internal state. I'll mostly focus on mice, but a lot of the ideas containing what I'm discussing extend to other species as well. So if you watched the human psychophysics video from Jenny Reed, you know that a common behavioral paradigm to study decision making is the two alternative forced choice task. And this is pretty much what it sounds like. You have two choices and you have to make a decision between them. So I might show you a grading and ask you whether it's on the left or the right side of the screen. So here you would answer left side and here you would answer right side. And we can vary the contrast of that grading to see what humans can perceive. The problem with animals is that they can't tell us their choice. They can't speak. <laughs> so we have to have a behavioral readout of their decisions. The International Brain Laboratory just published a paper that used this exact task that I just went through with the gradings on either side, and they had mice indicate their decisions by physically turning the wheel. So turning the wheel one way meant the grading was on the left, and the other way meant it was on the right. This isn't the only way to read out decisions. You can also have two spouts and mice lick at one or the other to indicate their decision. You can have two ports and mice physically move and poke their noses into one of the two ports. With monkeys, it's common to just read out their decisions based on where, where they look, so they could look to the left or the right, or they could use a joystick to indicate their decision. You can also modify this task. So I'll be Referring throughout this video to a study done by Simon Niesel in Ann Churchill's lab that came out in 2019. So in this study, they had mice performing a delayed 2AFC task. So while the mice were performing this task, they t recorded videos of them. So this is a side view of the mouse, and this is a view from the bottom up. So just to orient you, this is the mouse's snout. These are some spouts that can lick. These are its paws, and these are some handles that it can grab. So in this task, in a trial, the handles come in. Oh, and I'll show you a video of this in a second, but to orient you first, the handles come in. The mouse grabs the handles, and that's actually what initiates the trial. But at some random time after that, there's the stimuli on one side or the other. Then there's a one second delay, and then the animal licks one spout or the other to indicate its decision of where the stimuli are. 
And that delay is really so the act of perceiving the stimulus and the act of moving to make a decision are temporally segregated. So I'll show you a video of one trial of this task. So the handles will come in there. At some point, the mouse will grab one of the handles, which initiates the trial. In this video, you can't see the stimuli, but they can. And then they lick one spell or the other to indicate their decision. So just to go back to that end. Here you can see they're licking the spout to indicate their decision. As soon as they choose one, the other spout gets out of the way. So already we have a lot of behavioral readouts of this task. So the handles actually have sensors in them. So they record when the mouse grabs them. The spouts also have sp sensors, so they can record when the mouse licks them. We have the choice that the mouse made, left or right, and we have whether it was a success or not, whether the mouse was correct and got a reward. There's a lot more going on in this video, though, beyond those pretty coarse read readouts of the decisions and task-related movements. So if we watch it again, it's moving its face, so some whisker movements, it's moving its hands quite a bit in a second here. Um, there. And there's just a lot of movement that's not captured by what I just discussed. So increasingly in neuroscience, we're realizing that these more complex, fine-grained movements are important to study and capture and read out to better understand the brain. And we're increasingly focused on these complex movements and also more naturalistic behavior. And correspondingly, there's been an increased focus on analysis tools and pipelines to read out behavior from these really complex behavioral videos. Because these behavioral videos are amazing, but they're very complex, there are a lot of pixels, so just a lot of dimensions, and it's hard to do much analysis with them. So I'm gonna go um, for a few examples of what we can do. So we can do body part tracking. So if you see here on the fingers of the mouse's hand, there are markers. And if you watch as I play this video, those markers track where those fingers are at every time point. So now instead of having just this really complex video, we actually have each body part over time, the positions of it, and that's easier to work with. So you can do this manually. You can, on each frame, put a marker at where each body part is, but that takes a while. So there has been, um, a software package released by neuroscientists called Deep Lab Cut, and this will automate the process. So if you provide a few examples of where the body parts are, it trains a deep network, which is something you'll learn about in the Comp Neuro course, to be able to do this to all of the frames automatically, which saves you a lot of time. And this doesn't just work on mice. Here you can see an example of a fly, and you can see that we're tracking all of the body parts of the fly over time. And you can see even with that complex behavior, we at least can see that, that when the um, hind leg is moving. In the study I referred to by Simon Niesel, they didn't use deep lab cut exactly, but they used similar ideas to extract information from these behavioral videos. So they actually had yet another sensor that recorded when the mouse's hind limbs moved. They extracted the pupil diameter on, from this video, and they also extracted when the mouse whisked, so when it moved its whiskers. Even all that, though, is still very, um, very specific body parts and behaviors that we're capturing, and there's a lot of really tiny movements, like little tiny nose twitches or movements on its throat that are hard to track, even with something like deep lab cut. So in this study, they used an increasingly common technique, which is to get a lower dimensional representation of this video. And I won't go through the technical details of this because you'll be learning about low dimensional representations in the Comp Neuro course. But essentially at each time point, instead of all of the pixels, which is thousands, you can learn a lower dimensional representation. So in this study, they used 200 numbers. So 200 numbers at each time point conveyed most of the information and details in the video. And that's a lot easier to work with in terms of relating to neural activity or other analyses later on. 
So then in this study, they were also recording from the brain while the mice was the mouse was doing this task. So they used something called wide field imaging, and you'll actually hear from Anne Churchland in a different video about wide field imaging and see a tour of her lab. So I'm not going to go into details on that, but they record activity from the brain and they relate it to all of these behavioral readouts I've been talking about, and they find that the cortex wide activity is really dominated by movement especially the uninstructed movements, which are all the movements not related to the task. And this is, this shows us how important capturing all these behavioral readouts are because they're very important to understanding the brain because they're really influencing neural activity in the brain. I've mostly been talking about mice behaving in a head fixed way. So they are in place and can't really physically move about. But you can also look at more natural behaviors like mice roaming around. So Bob Data at Harvard developed a method where he has mice in an open field arena. And they're just being mice, doing natural behaviors and not performing a task. And then he can record from above using a depth camera. And this is sort of like a video camera, but it actually captures the depth to the kind of next thing below the camera. So this is really nice because it's easier to see, for example, if the mouse rears up because the depth will change of the mouse. And then he actually developed a analysis pipeline for videos where you can extract little behavioral syllables. So we got this lower dimensional representation that I just mentioned. And then he used something called a hidden Markov model, which again, you'll learn about in the course to extract little chunks of time where the mouse was doing something specific. So he could automatically tell chunks of time where the mouse was walking, where it was pausing and not moving much, where it was rearing. And so this allows us to really understand little component behavioral syllables that make up a mouse's behavior. You can also use mouse navigation itself as the behavioral readout. So a common behavioral paradigm in neuroscience is the Morris water maze task. And in this, you literally plunk a mouse into a bucket of water and it swims around and eventually it finds a hidden platform and it can get up on that hidden platform and out of the bucket. And if you do this a lot of times, always having a hidden platform in the same place, then the mouse after learning will swim directly towards it. And so then you can perform all sorts of manipulations. So you can put the mouse somewhere else and see how it can understand space to, and if it can swim directly to the hidden platform. You can look at like mouse models of diseases, if those mice have problems with this task and all sorts of things. So the key point here is that you can use the actual navigation itself as the behavioral readout of the mouse's learning and memory, specifically with regards to spatial learning and spatial navigation. You can also use natural behaviors to tell you about the internal state of the mouse or animal. So in the wild, if a mouse sees a predator bird overhead, like an eagle, it will freeze. So it will not move at all. And we can actually take advantage of this in the lab we can use freezing as an indirect measure of the fear of the mouse. And that means we can do things like we can shock the mouse with electric shocks that scares them in an environment. And then if we put them back in the environment two days later, we know if they remembered that experience because they'll freeze more because they're scared of that environment. Similarly, we can pair a auditory tone with the electric shocks and then we can see if the mice are conditioned to associate the tone with fear eventually, because they'll freeze just when they hear the tone. One last behavioral readout I want to mention is um, using eye tracking to report where an animal is looking in the visual field. So you can tell, you can use eye tracking to tell exactly where a monkey is looking at an image. And that tells you what they're paying attention to in the image or how they're parsing the image. And so as an example of what's that, what that has been used for is that several studies 
showed images of other monkeys to the behaving monkey. And so this is an image they showed. And the blue is where the monkey looked, recorded using eye tracking. And they saw that in general, the monkeys really especially looked at the eyes and they focused on the eyes. And so that's actually how humans parse images too. We tend to pay attention to the eyes. And so we see that monkeys parse faces similarly to humans, at least in that one respect. So hopefully this video has given you an idea of the vast array of behavioral readouts we can use in neuroscience and why we might use them. In future videos, you will learn about different ways of recording from the brain so that eventually we can get these behavioral readouts, we can get the neural activity, and we can start to understand what's happening.